Good day everyone. In this module, we will be discussing about the different classifications of heat exchangers and the methods used in heat exchanger analysis. At the end of this module, it is expected that you should be able to identify the various types of heat exchangers based on different physical characteristics, explain the different parameters involved in heat exchanger analysis, apply the log mean temperature difference method in selecting a heat exchanger to achieve a specified temperature difference, and apply the effectiveness NTU method in predicting the outlet temperatures in a pre-selected heat exchanger. Now let us start our discussion with answering the most obvious question. What is a heat exchanger? A heat exchanger is a device in which a hot fluid transfers heat to a cold fluid under constant pressure and steady flow conditions. In most cases, these two fluids are separated by a solid surface through which heat diffuses from the side of the hot fluid to the side of the cold fluid. The surfaces that we can find in a heat exchanger can be classified into two based on their intended purpose. A primary surface serves to separate the hot fluid and the cold fluid, thereby preventing the two fluids from mixing. And on the other hand, a secondary surface can have two functions. It can function either to direct fluid flow or to increase the heat transfer surface area. An example of a secondary surface which functions to direct fluid flow inside a heat exchanger is called baffles. These are commonly found in shell and tube heat exchangers. On the other hand, an example of a secondary surface which functions to increase the heat transfer surface area is fins. We can classify the different types of heat exchangers based on their characteristics. These features may involve how heat is being transferred within the heat exchanger, its degree of compactness, its main physical features, the relative flow directions of the hot and cold fluids, the number of heat transfer fluids, and the main mechanism by which heat is being transferred. Now let's start our discussion with characterizing heat exchangers by their main heat transfer process. Under this criterion, we can categorize heat exchangers as either direct contact or indirect contact. In direct contact heat exchangers, there is no solid surface separating the hot and cold fluids. An example of this is the wet cooling tower which is commonly found in thermal power plants and in large commercial and industrial facilities. This heat exchanger works by forcing outside air into the cooling tower column within which hot fluid is con continuously fed through spray nozzles at the upper portion of the tower. Then the cold fresh air comes into contact with the hot water droplets thereby allowing convection heat transfer to occur. Now let us discuss indirect contact heat exchangers. This, there are two main uh, types of heat exchangers under this category. The most common indirect contact heat exchangers are those in which a primary surface exists between the heat exchanger fluids. An example of this is the shell and tube heat exchanger. We refer to this as direct heat transfer exchangers or simply recuperators. On the other hand, in some indirect contact heat exchangers, there is intermittent heat exchange occurring through a high heat capacity matrix. This is achieved by heat storage in the matrix and its subsequent release from the heat exchanger surface. An example of this heat exchanger is this rotary wheel. We refer to this storage type heat exchangers as 
or we refer to these heat exchangers as storage type heat exchangers or simply as regenerators. The next characteristic by which we can categorize heat exchangers is related to their degree of compactness. We can determine how compact a heat exchanger is using the parameter called area density. It is often, it is often denoted by the Greek letter beta. It is computed by dividing the total surface area where heat transfer occurs by the total volume of the heat exchanger. Now, the threshold at which we can consider a heat exchanger to be compact depends on the phase of the heat transfer fluids. A heat, a heat exchanger a heat exchanger in which the heat transfer fluids are liquids can be considered compact if its area density exceeds 400 square meter per cubic meter. An example of this is the printed circuit heat exchanger, which has an area density of approximately 2,500. On the other hand, a heat exchanger in which one of the heat transfer fluids is a gas, while the other is either a liquid or a gas, can be considered compact if its area density exceeds 700 square meters per cubic meter. An example of this is our lungs which has an area density of approximately 20,000. Now you know the, that the reason why the air that we exhale is hot. No? This is due to the heat exchange that happens in our lungs between the air that we breathe and the warm blood circulating in our body. The third characteristic by which we can categorize heat exchangers is related to how they are constructed. Under this criterion, we can categorize them as either tubular heat exchangers, plate heat exchangers, heat exchangers with extended surfaces, and heat exchangers with regenerative matrices. Now let us start with tubular heat exchangers. From the name itself, tubular heat exchangers is built by putting rows of tubes in parallel to one another, such as in this shell and tube heat exchanger or by concentrically putting one tube inside another tube, such as in this double pipe heat exchanger. The next type of heat exchanger is the plate heat exchanger. It is built by arranging vertical plates in parallel to one another. Heat transfer occurs in this type of heat exchanger by allowing cold and hot fluids to flow alternately between each other. The third type is the extended surface heat exchanger. It is built by attaching fins outside the surface of a tube to increase the convection heat transfer surface area. The fourth type is the regenerative matrices. There are two types of regenerators under this category. First is the static regenerator and second is the rotary generator. In static regenerators, hot and cold fluids flow intermittently through the regenerative matrix via different flow ports. The matrix remains stationary in this type of regenerator. The main drawback of using static regenerator is that the cold and hot fluids cannot flow at the same, tr at the same time through the regenerator. On the other hand, in rotary regenerators, the regenerative matrix moves, usually through a rotary motion. This allows the hot and cold fluids to flow simultaneously through different portions of the matrix. If you want to view the, uh, if you want to view the full videos of the working principles of these two types of regenerators, you can click on the link provided in the description box of this video. The next criterion by which we can categorize heat exchangers is related to how the heat transfer fluids flow inside of them. Under this category, heat exchangers can be classified as either single-pass or multi-pass heat exchangers. Single-pass heat exchangers can be further categorized into parallel flow, counter flow, 
or cross-flow heat exchangers. In parallel flow heat exchangers, the hot and cold fluids enter and exit the heat exchanger at the same site. On the other hand, in counter-flow heat exchangers, the hot and cold fluids enter and exit at opposite sides of the heat exchanger. Finally, in cross-flow heat exchangers, the hot and cold fluids flow perpendicularly to each other. A common example of this is the radiator of our cars. Now let us discuss multi-pass heat exchangers. Shell and tube heat exchangers can be further classified according to the number of times the shell side and tube side fluids pass through the heat exchanger. Now let us give examples of this. This is a schematic of a one shell pass to two tube passes heat exchanger. I'm now going to show you how we count how we count the number of passes for each fluid. From the inlet, the tube side fluid flows in this direction first. Then it changes direction and flows in this way as it exits the heat exchanger. Since the tube side fluid flows in two directions from the inlet inlet to the outlet, then this heat exchanger has two tube passes. Now let us go to the shell side fluid. From the inlet, the shell side fluid flows in this direction until it exits the heat exchanger. Since the shell side fluid flows in only one general direction, then this heat exchanger has one shell pass. Now let us give another example. This is the schematic of a two shell passes, four tube passes heat exchanger. From this diagram, we can say that the tube, the, the tube side fluid flows in four different directions. The first tube passes through this direction, the second tube passes through this, the third tube passes through this, and the fourth tube passes through this direction. Now let us go to the shell side fluid. From the inlet, the shell side fluid flows first in this direction, then it exits the heat exchanger in this direction. Since the shell side fluid flowed in two opposite directions, inside the heat exchanger, then this heat, then this heat exchanger has two shell passes. The next category by which we can classify heat exchangers is related to the number of fluids that are involved during the heat transfer process. Under this classification, we have two fluid heat exchangers and three fluid heat exchangers. But between these two types, the two fluid heat exchanger is the more common type. The last category by which we can classify heat exchangers is related to the heat transfer mechanism occurring inside these devices. If only sensible heat is transferred by the hot fluid and is received by the cold fluid, then the heat exchanger involves single phase heating or cooling. Remember that when sensible heat is absorbed or rejected, the only indication that heat transfer occurred is when there is a change in temperature. Therefore, the phase of the hot and cold fluids does not change during the entire heat transfer process. On the other hand, if the heat absorbed by one of the fluids is entirely or partly in the form of latent heat va of vaporization, then boiling is the mechanism of heat transfer inside the heat exchanger. Next, if the heat rejected by one of the fluids is entirely or partly in the form of a latent heat of, of condensation, then condensation is the mechanism of heat transfer inside the heat exchanger. Finally, it is also possible for heat to be transferred from one surface to another by radiation just like the one occurring inside our microwave ovens. We have now finished discussing the different types of heat exchangers. In the next video, we will discuss how we can analyze heat transfer inside heat exchangers.